Um, thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you, um, Joachim Bonham, President of PS, uh, and, and thank you, um, Director General Graciano. And thank you, everybody. I'm, I will try to be brief, Joachim. The, um, the, the topic that I've uh, been given is, is why does the consumption of nutritious, safe food matter and how to achieve it? So not, not an easy task. And forgive me for, forgive me for moving around walking around. Um, so here's the state of, uh, of the world in, in terms of the different forms of malnutrition. Actually, the yellow, the yellow circle is already out of date, as Director General uh, Graciano de Silva mentioned. It's not 1.9 billion overweight or obese, it's now 2.6. So that gives you a sense of how quickly things are changing. The, um, the small circles are the under five stunted, wasting, and overweight, and those numbers are coming down at least for stunting and wasting, but coming down too slowly. The chronic hunger number, again, uh, uh, Director General De Silva has told us the 815 is now 821 million as of yesterday, and the 2 billion deficient in micronutrients, who knows what that number really is. It's kind of been stuck there for a very long time. So the, this gives you a sense of the, the, the level of scandal that I think uh, Excellency Gallagher communicated to us in his, in his talk. And what's, what's creating a sense of urgency is that we don't really know what's going to happen. Business as usual kind of gives us the sense that the yellow circle is going to keep increasing. We're not doing a very good job of keeping a lid on overweight and obesity. We think the chronic hunger number will eventually begin to come down. Uh, we don't know what's happening with the deficiency in vitamins and minerals. And we think the, the stunted numbers and the wasted numbers are coming down, but not fast enough. Um, and the under five overweights, the dark blue circle is increasing. So we have a pretty serious situation where we think there's about one in three malnourished now, and without concerted change, we may end up with one in two by 2030. And at the center of all of that, all of those forms of malnutrition is really poor diets. There's lots of other things driving all of these different manifestations of malnutrition, but the common denominator is poor diets. And why does, why do poor, what's the consequence of poor diets? It's not just a nutrition issue, it's actually a massive health issue. If you look at the um, risk factors for the burden of disease, uh, we have a global burden of disease number, but we now, thanks to uh, WHO and I AHME, we have national numbers. And this is the national number for India. And it's a difficult graph to read, but basically these are the top 10 risk factors for the burden of disease in India. And the individual ones are not that important. But if you look, six of these top 10 on the right are related to food consumption. So food is, is actually a massive driver of the burden of disease in each country in the world. And just to give you a sense that it's not just India, here's, here are the numbers for Italy. And for Italy, um, five of the top 10 risk factors for the burden of disease are related to what we eat. So what we eat is absolutely essential. Now, in most, in most things in, in international development, global development, things get better as incomes rise. Not everything, obviously. Uh, climate change doesn't necessarily get better. Natural resource use doesn't improve the efficiency of it. And diets certainly fall into that category. There's no automatic improvement in the quality of diets as countries grow economically. Here you have some data from nine of the countries that uh, GAIN has, has offices in. And I, I got the Global Dietary Database, which is at Tufts University, to generate these estimates for GAIN so, so we know how we can target our work better. But I thought I would share them with you. And you can see for the, the four Asian countries on the left, things like vegetables and pulse consumption, seafood consumption, are sort of going up slowly. This is over a 20-year period. So this isn't much of a percentage increase over a 20-year period. And the red bar is sugar-sweetened beverages, and that's going up a little bit. But now, switch over to the five African countries, and you can see in Ethiopia, uh, everything's going the wrong way. Vegetables and pulses down, seafood down, and sugar-sweetened beverages up. In fact, only in Kenya of those five African countries do we see a really sort of a positive trend. Um, sugar-sweetened beverages coming down, and vegetables, pulses, and seafoods going up. So income growth is not going to change this. So what's going on? Forgive me for putting in uh, a picture of, this is where I live. I live in Brighton in the UK. And the UK has just had its hottest summer for 40 years or 50 years um, this, this year. And there were lots of comparisons between 1976 
and today, because 1976 was the last time the UK had a very hot summer. And there were lots of pictures of people on beaches from 1976 and today. And there was a, an article in the, the Guardian newspaper that said, you know, if you look at this, this is not very scientific, but if you look at the pictures of people on beaches in 1976 compared to today, UK, a lot more people are overweight. So what's going on? Have we all sort of become much worse at making decisions about what we eat? Well, no, we haven't. It's just the environment around us has made it much harder to purchase healthy food. And this is going on in every country in the world. So the first problem is that food availability has diversified very weakly. If you look at this graph, the vertical graph is how many calories are from things other than cereals and other staples. Um, and the right hand, the horizontal axis, is how many calories are available per day. Um, so East Asia has gone from, in a 50-year period, it's gone from low diversity to high diversity, and it's gone from low quantity to high quantity. Uh, if you compare that to South Asia, much less improvement in diversity, and Sub-Saharan Africa, um, less improvement in diversity. So food availability has diversified very weakly. But because most people acquire food from the markets, we have to look at affordability. So again, these are the nine countries that, that Gain works in. And I put these numbers up because actually they're really hard to get, and the World Bank Living Standards Measurement Survey folks did them for us. And they show the percentage of food and beverages that are actually purchased in, in markets. And you can see, obviously, in urban areas, the yellow bars, most food, nearly, every, nearly all food is purchased in markets. But even in the rural areas beyond uh, the three countries on the left, most people buy most food from markets. So we have to look at affordability. But what's been happening to affordability? Study in the Lancet Global Health from 2016 says if every, if every person in a household was to purchase five fruits and vegetables a day, which is a fairly standard recommendation across many countries, for these four countries, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, and Zimbabwe, the estimate it would take 52% of a household income to do that, to buy five fruits and vegetables. And that's clearly uh, unaffordable. Um, and the prices of nutrient-rich foods are increasing. This is some research done by our colleagues at IFBRI in Ethiopia. Um, you remember I showed you the other, the other graph where from the Global Dietary Database that Ethiopia was going in the wrong direction on a number of things. Well, this is why. Um, the change in real prices between 2007 and 2016, a nine-year period, the things that are becoming cheaper are things like oils, fats, sugar, honey, grains, roots, and tubers. And the things that are becoming more expensive are things that we think of as really important parts of healthy diets. Uh, and these are big, these are big increases in, in prices. But it's not just about availability and affordability. We have to make nutritious food really desirable. We have to make it tasty, and we have to make it aspirational. Um, now, the private sector is brilliant at generating um, demand for their products, and they spend a lot of money. This is how much the Hershey and General Mills spent on advertising in 2016, $1 billion. The blue circle is how much the aid community spent on diet-related NCDs in 2014, 50 million. So the spending differential means that the public sector really has to do a good job in creating demand for healthy food. But nutritious foods, I think, are losing the desirability war. Public service announcements for nutritious food are being overwhelmed by commercial ads, both financially but also persuasively. This is from Australia, uh, go, go for two and five. This is a public service announcement from Australia. And this is a, an ad on a, a telephone kiosk in, in the US. I think it's the US. Um, you can never be too thin. So you can see which one of those is, is going to be more attractive and more, more engaging and more captivating. Uh, for me, it's certainly the one on the right. And there are countless examples of this. So the, what's going on? Um, it, Food systems determine availability, affordability, and desirability. Food systems are quite complicated. This is a very simple characterization. You may not think it's simple, but it is a simple characterization. On the outside, you have food supply. The, the red circle is where the consumer comes, engages with that food supply. Uh, and the consumer engages with the food environment, and their preferences, their time, their knowledge, and their purchasing power determine their quality. 
food systems are not geared to deliver nutritious food, they're geared to deliver profit. Jobs, taxes, um, and revenue. But the good news is there's lots of opportunities to change food systems to make them more geared. In agriculture, we could have a much greater emphasis on the productivity of fruits, vegetables, uh, animal source foods, and fish. In the food storage and transport area, too much is lost. And the stuff that is lost tends to be more nutritious because it's more fresh fruits. In the food, transf uh, in the food transformation subsystem, uh, as the Director General of FAO was saying, too many food transformations are into foods with low fiber, high salt, high sugar, high fats. And that's because of convenience of transport. And we have to, we have to challenge that. And then food retailing, too much of the, 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 the junk food is, is retailed and targeted towards young children. Not just through radio or TV or, or posters, but through games uh, and videos and movies uh, and music. It's, it's very, very insidious. And that means that nutritious foods are less desirable, less affordable, less available. Consumers have less information, less real choice, and they make bad decisions. So where to start? This is a deliberately fuzzy picture of lots of arrows. And it's supposed to com communicate the idea that every country will have to chart its own path. Because I think every country is, is different. But nevertheless, there are some commonalities in here. First of all, governments need to build the demand for nutritious foods. Companies are not going to do it. They're going to build demand for their product. They're not going to do this. This is, a, this is a collective good that government needs to lead. And I think it needs to, to use hybrids of public and private approaches. The left side of the book um, is very rational, very linear, very evidence-based, very scientific. And that's where the government comes in and says, this is what, what needs to happen. This is, this is the guideline. This is the direction of travel. This is the goal. But the right side is the aspirational the emotional, the, um, the, the, the non-rational uh, way of thinking. And many of us buy things in a very non-rational way. I know I do. Um, I don't always buy things because they're good for me or, or they're, they're healthy. I buy things because they taste good or they look good and maybe my friends are buying it. And we need, to, we need to key into that. And here's an example of some work that we're doing in Kenya with the government of Kenya and uh, a couple of adver advertising agencies about around building better Kenyans. And we're really trying to link in you know, to things that Kenyans, ordinary Kenyans that care about. Their sports heroes, their, um, their creative uh, energies around um, the software industry and the, um, the music scene in Kenya. We're trying to say, to sound beautiful, you have to eat beautiful. So we're, we're testing these, these messages out. Businesses need to realize that being purpose-driven is the smart thing to do. It's really difficult to find evidence that this actually does pay off. But here's a very recent paper, actually from last year, um, that says uh, during the financial crisis, this is for US companies, uh, firms with high social capital, as measured by uh, corporate social responsibility activities, actually had a stock returns at the end of the day after the financial crisis that were 4 to 7% higher than firms with low social capital. So there is some evidence, and we need to find more, that being purpose-driven is also a smart commercial thing to do. Policymakers, it's not just businesses that have to change, though. Policymakers also have to change. They have to be much more active in incentivizing corporations. Yes, we need to penalize and restrict bad behavior, but we also have to incentivize and promote good behavior. Um, really interesting stuff. A gain, of, a gain from the United States, a big survey of C-suite, you know, CEOs, CSOs, uh, um, CFOs, uh, COOs, big survey saying who is demanding their company is more purpose-driven. So it's a survey. Turns out that regulators and policymakers are not as active as I would have thought in demanding that companies become more purpose-driven. The real drivers are the, are the employees, especially the new hires and the current employees. So again, um, are we doing enough to, to latch on to this, this potential that employees of companies really care about what their company uh, does and how it's seen and how it's seen by their families and friends? Governments also need to create more of an enabling environment for businesses to do good things for nutrition. The World Bank has a, a, a doing business report, which says how easy is it for a business to get a, re get a license or, or purchase something or import something? How easy is it for a business to do business? We need something similar for how easy does a government make it 
for businesses to do good things for nutrition and how hard does it make it for them to do bad things. And we are working, uh, GAIN is working to develop an analog for nutritious food. How easy is it for businesses uh, how easy does the government make it for businesses to do good things for nutrition? Civil society needs to expand the spotlight on business conduct. Uh, we are a big fan of the Access to Nutrition Index and the, and the ATNF Foundation, but they only, they only focus on the top 30 or so big companies in the world, food companies, and they take 300 questions to assess the companies. In addition, for maybe smaller companies at the national level, we are working with them to see if we can develop an index that uses not 300 questions, but 30 questions. And it's, it's, will therefore be more inclusive and actually much more useful to help those businesses decide how they can do more for nutrition. And all of this will have to be done sustainably, as, as Joachim mentioned. Uh, and we're, I think we're a little bit complacent. Certainly those of us in the nutrition world are a bit complacent about the sustainability issue. We think a move to more plant-based uh, approaches is healthier and better for the planet because of greenhouse gas emission. But don't forget about energy use and water use. And here's some data from the, uh, world, the Global Water Footprint Initiative. And it shows that you know, all fruits and vegetables are not the same when it comes to water use and their water footprint. Huge, huge, diver huge um, diversity in how much water is required um, per, gram of, uh, per gram of these different fruits and vegetables. So that's something else we need a much stronger evidence base on. Um, my, my last few slides, Joachim. Changing norms is absolutely key. Norms of policymakers, norms of everybody. I had this, this is a quote from a tweet uh, a response to a tweet I made last year. I was tweeting about some study that had shown we really should be, you know, we really should be, uh, some, some groups of the population in some countries really should be eating less meat. And I got a tweet back saying, from, from an African uh, tweeter saying, let us eat our ham in peace. You know, we spent so many years banishing hunger and now you're telling us we can't eat meat. So I think this is something we need to be very sensitive to and very alive to. There's also lots of policy levers that we're not using, I think. Um, I was at a meeting in Japan last week on universal health care, and one of the very strong conclusions that came through from the science was the longer you delay universal health care, the more expensive it's going to get because of non-communicable disease, poor diets, driving up costs. So here's another, here's a, here's a lever we can use if we care about healthy diets. Universal health care is a lever we it's not one we would naturally come to, but we have to be creative in how we find these things. I think um, policymakers need uh, a, really s a, s a very straightforward, simple, no regrets menu of what to do. Having a, food s having a food system approach has lots of advantages, but it's very complicated and very uh, systems thinking is difficult and complicated. So we have to, we have to create some simplicity. This is uh, a, a very simple sort of N intervention model that we have in the undernutrition side. I think we need something kind of similar for policymakers. We need a menu of what works to improve food systems for nutrition and food safety. We need to, need to make it easier for them to act. Um, finally, we need to see businesses in a more nuanced way. There are too many people who only see businesses as part of the problem. And undoubtedly they are part of the problem, but they are a big part of the solution. We won't be able to do, do this without businesses. And to do this, we have to engage. My final slide. To make all of this happen, multi-stakeholder dialogue is essential. And I agree with you, Joachim. I'm not terribly comfortable with the stakeholder word. word. It, makes, makes it makes you feel like it's somebody else's job to do it. But it's actually all of our jobs to do this. Um, this is just a random set of things, I, uh, a random set of images I picked up about dialogues. And you know, these things are really important, actually, for the things we care about, working conditions, um, self-love, um, happiness. But I want to see more dialogues at the national and subnational level on how do we create the demand for nutritious food? How do we get a f nutritious foods not 10% cheaper, but 10 times as, as cheap as they are now? And uh, we need to see dialogues on the enabling environment. Most importantly, I think, and this goes back to His Excellency Gallagher's uh, comments at the beginning about being aware and being self-aware, the first step to transforming food systems is to be open to the transformation of our own ideas. M my own ideas have sort of certainly evolved over the last five to ten years about diets and food systems. And I think ideology 
is our enemy and what we're trying to do. And I would urge all of us to follow the example that uh, uh, His Excellency Gallagher said and be aware and, and self-aware. Thank you, Jörg. Sorry, Jörg, it took so long. <laughs>